Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you're new, welcome. First, I just want to say if you have been watching my videos and enjoying them, if you could please subscribe to my channel, that would be lovely and that way you won't miss the next one. Today we're going to be talking about a heartbreaking and extremely distressing case out of Iran. This case contains themes of child sexual abuse and rape as well as murder. So if you don't want to hear about those things right now, please go ahead and click out of the video. Just one more thing before we get started. I just want to point out that it's very important to distinguish between the government and the people here. So we're going to be talking about the government of Iran, and this in no way represents Iranian citizens as a whole. So please just keep that in mind. So with that, I will go ahead and get started. Atifa Rajabi Sahale was born either on September 21st, 1987, or sometime in 1988. I'm not sure which is correct, because at least one newspaper at the time reported her birthday as September 21st, 1987, but there's also a documentary about this case that I watched, and they show the documents and it appears to say 1988. The family also says 1988 throughout the documentary, so I think 1988 is more accurate. It doesn't really make a huge difference because there's not very much difference between those dates anyway. So Atifa was born in a large Iranian city called Mashhad, and her family was quite poor. Her mother's name was Bibi Ra'i, and her father was Safar Ali. At some point, Atifa's family relocated to a town called Nika, which is an industrial town on the Caspian Sea, and in 2006, it had about 46,000 residents. When Atifa was five, her parents got divorced, but then her mother almost immediately died in a car accident. And not long after that, Atifa's little brother ended up drowning in a river because of the lack of supervision. The dual losses of his wife and his son really affected Atifa's father, Safar Ali, and unfortunately, he ended up becoming a heroin addict. Atifa's father loved her very much, but he just wasn't around that much. He sold secondhand clothing for a living, and so he would travel from town to town doing that, and plus, being a drug addict, he just wasn't really able to be present in her life. So as you can imagine, Atifa did not grow up in a very stable environment. At first, her father would just leave her with some neighbors, and she was eventually taken into the social work system, so I guess she was in foster care for a little while. When she was eight, her father finally took her to live with her elderly grandparents. Her grandfather was 90 years old, and her grandmother was 70, they both had crippling arthritis, and both of them were hard of hearing, really almost deaf. Atifa took amazing care of her grandparents. She cleaned their entire house and cooked for them all the time, and she even bathed them. But even though she was so caring and loving, they just kind of didn't really care about her. They just sort of ignored her, and certainly their care was inadequate. That's according to a social worker's notes that were taken when Atifa was 13, and they also say that she was desperate for love and kindness. Even though she was in such unfortunate circumstances, Atifa was described as being lively and intelligent and being very kind. Atifa was also a beautiful girl. Normally, I don't like to comment on what people look like, but that may end up being a huge part of the story. So due to these circumstances, Atifa really grew up without much discipline or supervision. And she was known as the Gypsy of Neka because she would roam around in the streets by herself. And unfortunately, this made her quite vulnerable, especially in a country like Iran, which has some very misogynistic laws. Unfortunately, there was something much darker going on in Atifa's life that was a secret. And that was that when she was nine, 
a neighbor started raping her and he would pay her to be quiet. And Atifa ended up living off of this money. Even if Atifa had reported this, it's unlikely in Iran that she would have been believed, especially because she was so vulnerable without any parents or anyone protecting her. And by the way, the age of consent in Iran for girls is nine. Before I continue, I need to explain something about Iran, and that's that they have something called the religious police. They're also known as the morality police or the guidance patrol. So the function of these morality police is that they're supposed to make sure that everyone in the whole country is abiding by the laws of their version of Islam. For girls and women, that mostly means that they police what they're wearing, and most importantly, that they're wearing a headscarf, which is required starting at age nine. By the way, Iran is one of only two countries that requires the headscarf. The other one is Afghanistan, so this is not a normal thing in the Muslim world. The other things they police are whether women are covered from head to toe, because the only parts of their bodies they're supposed to show are their faces and hands. And they're not supposed to wear cosmetics, or at least excessive cosmetics. Boys and girls and men and women are not supposed to be socializing together in Iran. And they're also not supposed to be drinking alcohol. So one thing that the morality police do a lot is they will bust parties. So Iran is full of young people who want to get together and have parties, just like young people all over the world. And the morality police will come in and bust the party, and all the attendees will be sentenced to lashes. I'm not going to describe what lashes are here. It is a very gruesome corporal punishment. It is excruciatingly painful. So starting when she was 13 or 14, Atifa was arrested three different times for what were called crimes against chastity. And these crimes were... One, being alone in a car with her male cousin. Two, being at a cafe when it was raided, and I'm not sure what happened there. And three, being at a party. She was convicted all three times and sent to short stents in prison at Bashar Prison, which was about 30 minutes east of Necca. Iran's prisons are notoriously horrible, and the people who work there definitely torture people into confessing. Girls and women are also regularly sexually abused and raped in Iran's prisons, and it's safe to say that Atifa suffered horrible traumas all three times that she was in prison. In fact, she told her grandmother that the pain was so bad from what had happened to her in prison that she could only walk on all fours. She also told one of her friends that Bashar prison was hell itself and that she had regular nightmares about it. Atifa actually had a really sweet boyfriend named Hassan. And Hassan was totally in love with Atifa. He actually cut her hair, which apparently needed to be cut. He would take her out to eat and buy her clothes, and he bought her a cell phone. And Hassan even went to go see her in prison all three times that she was there which is significantly more than her father went because apparently her father only visited her for 10 minutes the whole time she was in prison. Hassan told someone that he loved Atifa more than life itself. So Atifa and Hassan were supposed to go to a wedding together one Saturday in early May 2004, and Atifa was over the moon excited about this. She spent a long time picking out the right outfits, and she just could not wait to go to this wedding with Hassan. But before she could go, she had to make dinner for her grandparents, and she asked her grandfather to go to the market and get some tomatoes. Atifa was in the middle of making chicken and rice when the morality police busted in her grandparents' house and arrested her, and they wouldn't even let her turn off the stove. This happened right as Atifa's grandfather got home with the tomatoes, and he was unable to turn the stove off himself because of arthritis, so he had to ask some neighbors to come over and turn it off. So the reason the morality police gave for arresting Atifa was this petition 
that was dated April 25th, 2004, which said that Atifa was a source of immorality, was having sex with various men, and was a terrible influence on local schoolgirls. However, this petition had no signatures from anyone in the community. It was just signed by two members of the morality police. One source says that her grandfather also lodged a complaint against her, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. So once again, Atifa had to go to court, and unfortunately, the judge that was going to hold Atifa's trial was extremely powerful. His name was Haji Rezai, and he wasn't just a judge, he was also the prosecutor and jury. All defendants in Iran are supposed to have an attorney, and supposedly Atifa did have one, but he left in the middle of the trial due to a heart condition. Also, there was no documentation about him in her file. The only person who came to court to support Atifa was her nearly senile grandfather. Apparently, Judge Rezai looked at Atifa's body and decided that she was 22, which she was not 22. She was 16, a child. Judge Rezai started interrogating Atifa, and that's when it came out that she had been having sex with a 51-year-old cab driver named Ali Darabi. And by the way, Ali Darabi also knew Atifa's father. Ali Darabi was a married man with children, and he was also a former member of the Revolutionary Guard, which is Iran's military. So apparently, this had been going on since Atifa was 13 years old. Now, in a lot of places, a 13-year-old having sex with a 51-year-old would be considered statutory rape. However, as I said earlier, the age of consent in Iran is 9 for girls. In Iran, in all cases of rape, even when the girl is a minor, it's extremely difficult to prove. You'd either have to have a confession or multiple witnesses to this rape. And also, men can almost always get away with rape because they can just say that the woman wasn't dressed properly. So in Iran, rape is basically always the fault of the girl or woman who was raped. Girls and women are seen as seductresses, and men are seen as vulnerable victims to their seduction who can't control themselves. So that's why women and girls are supposed to be covered. So of course, during this trial, Atifa was just completely railroaded by Judge Rezai. And when she realized how this trial was going, and that Judge Rezai was not going to believe that she was raped, she got very upset and she actually took off her headscarf. She was shouting at Judge Rezai and saying that Ali Darabi should be on trial instead of her, and she was so upset that she actually took her shoes off and threw them at him. Judge Rezai would later say that she had undressed in court and had a sharp tongue. Now, under normal Iranian law, Atifa would have been sentenced to 80 lashes, because her crime would have been fornication, not adultery, because she wasn't married. But because this was her fourth conviction, Judge Rezai used that as an excuse to sentence her to death. By the way, under Iranian law, men and women are supposed to get the same sentence for adultery or sex outside of marriage, but Ali Darabi only got 75 lashes. For some strange reason, Judge Rezai was just bound and determined to have Atifa killed. That's right. He sentenced a 16-year-old girl to death for being raped. Also, Iran was a signatory on the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which was supposed to mean that they would not execute people under 18, And they reiterated this in 1995. They promised that they would stop executing minors, but they didn't. They kept on doing it, and they're still doing it to this day. When people in Neka heard about Atifa's sentence, 
They were incredibly upset and they drew up their own petition. And this petition was real. It had 43 signatures on it. This petition said that Achifa was arrested while she was alone, had severe psychological issues, and should not be executed. She reiterated these points in a letter that she wrote in her own defense, which said this, I witnessed my parents' disputes and conflicts in my childhood. I was very young when my mother left my father and subsequently died in a car accident. My brother drowned in a river six months later. My sister and I grew up in the city of Mashhad, and I was turned over to my grandparents when I hit puberty. There is medical documentation and evidence that proves I suffer from a weak mental and emotional state, and that there are times in a 24-hour period where I lose my senses and my mind, and I become capable of doing anything negative or positive. I can only prove my claim local officials and witnesses and medical tests by the medical examiner's office. So, of course, Atifa appealed her sentence to the Supreme Court in Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. Now, according to the law, when a person makes a confession, they have to be of completely sound mind and the confession must be made of their own volition. So technically, because all four of her convictions were based on her confessions, which were made while she was under psychological distress, none of them should have been admissible in court. So in the United States, the standard of proof for conviction is beyond a reasonable doubt. But in Iran, it's the judge's knowledge. However, The judge's knowledge is not supposed to be able to convict someone of adultery. And that is not supposed to be relied upon at all in that circumstance. Any way that you look at this, this case had serious, serious problems from A to Z. It was just a totally bogus case. But here's the thing. The Iranian Revolution happened in 1979. And basically, it started off as people being against the Shah and pro-democracy. And it turned into this really extreme fundamentalist version of Islam and religious figures taking over the entire government. And these people were not very nice because in the early 80s, they started mass executing all kinds of citizens all over Iran just for being pro-democracy or supposedly against the new regime. And Judge Rezai was probably, according to his history, one of these people who went around killing all of these people in Iran in the early 80s. And those people were so loyal to the regime that they are considered completely immune from any sort of prosecution at all. So basically, Judge Rezai could do whatever he wanted. Usually appeals to the Supreme Court of Iran take months, at least six months. But somehow, Atifa's appeal only took one. In fact, Judge Rezai went to Tehran himself to basically make sure that they were not going to grant her an appeal. And he was successful because they denied her appeal. And they said this, Atifa Rajabi Sahale, age 22, daughter of Safar Ali, Since she has confessed to this crime, and it is her fourth time, we issue the verdict of execution. Execution will take place in a public place in Neka, so that the public may learn from it. This was signed by a judge named Mosani Ejai, and right after this, he would become the head of intelligence for the entire country. So after this happened, there were people in NECA who were trying to meet with Judge Rezai to try to get him to change his mind, maybe buy Atifa a little bit more time. But he would tell people that he was going on vacation and he couldn't meet with them. And that was because he was not going to hear anything about Atifa not being executed. He was going to make sure this girl was executed at whatever cost. He really did not care. Atifa said that she wanted to meet with her family one more time before her execution, which I don't think she was allowed to do. 
She was also forced to write a will in which she said that she wanted her possessions to go to an orphan girl who was getting married soon. This is extremely disturbing, but under Iranian law, people are supposed to be stoned to death. But in the 1990s, they started hanging people by crane. On the night of August 14th, 2004, a crane appeared in the middle of the town square in Neca, and everyone knew what that meant. The next morning, a crowd gathered there. In Iran, executions are public, and people actually go to them. This is, of course, all part of their mandate to control the whole population. So Atifa was taken to the town square, where she was heckled by a bunch of men. None of her friends or family were there, and she had no idea what was about to happen. Apparently, one of the morality police people whispered in her ear, Forgive us if we have to be a little bit rough with you. Atifa replied not to worry, because all of this just happened because she was raped, and not to worry about it. But guess who was standing right there, ready to put the noose around her neck. None other than Judge Rezai himself, who was not supposed to do that. It was supposed to be done by a separate official. When she realized at the last second what was happening, she asked God to forgive her if she had done anything wrong. And just 105 days after her fourth arrest for a crime against chastity, on Sunday August 15th, 2004, Atifa Rajabi Sahale was hoisted up by crane where she died and Judge Rezai left her body hanging there for 45 minutes. Atifa was just 16 years old. One witness to the execution said this, when agents of the state security forces brought her to the gallows, I felt cold sweat running down my back. She looked so young and innocent, standing there in the middle of all these bearded men in military fatigues. Judge Rezai must have felt a personal grudge against her. He put the rope around her neck and left her dangling on the gallows for 45 minutes. I looked around and everyone in the crowd was sobbing and damning the mullahs for doing this to our young people. So Atifa's family and friends had no idea this was happening. And her paternal aunt actually heard about it and went to the brick factory where Atifa's father was working and told him what happened. He didn't even know. And it was only after her execution that her family was given all of the court documents and they realized that all of them said that Atifa was 22, just because that's what Judge Rezai decided when he looked at her. Unfortunately, they hadn't realized that this issue of her age was a huge problem for the case. And if they brought it up, it probably would have saved her life or at least bought her two more years. They were so outraged that they started showing everyone in the town Atifa's birth certificate, which apparently said 1988, and eventually this reached Judge Rezai, who apparently when he saw it, started sweating with big beads of sweat dripping down his face. Except we know that Judge Rezai knew that she was 16 because her death certificate said that she was 16, born in 1988. Now, you must be wondering, what exactly did Judge Rezai have against Atifa? I mean, we know that Iran has all these misogynistic laws, but this seems really extreme. Well, according to her family, Judge Rezai asked Atifa to be his temporary wife so that they could have sex. So in Iran, in their version of Islam, they have this thing called a temporary wife, also known as a sige. And basically, this is a legal version of prostitution. And by the way, a man can have as many temporary wives as he wants, but a woman is not allowed to have any other husband at all, even like a primary proper husband. And she also doesn't get financial support from the temporary husband. Her family refused for her to become 
Judge Rezai's temporary wife. And so that may be one reason that he had such a grudge against her. Not only that, but just a few weeks later, Judge Rezai and two other officials were arrested. Not only did Judge Rezai confess to torturing Atifa, but all three of them confessed to raping her. Basically, Atifa was being used and abused by all of these men who knew that she was vulnerable and had no protection. Someone asked Judge Rezai what the rush was with Atifa's case, because none of this is normal in Iran at all. And he said that there was too much immoral behavior going on in Neka, and that he was concerned because it was summer and tourists would be visiting. By the way, Neka is not a tourist town. Just to make this horrible situation a tiny bit worse, the day after she was executed, Atifa's body was stolen from her grave. The speculation about this is that this probably happened to conceal evidence of what Judge Rezai and or the other people who raped Atifa were doing to her. There is some precedence for this happening because just the previous year, in 2003, an Iranian-Canadian photographer named Zara Kazemi visited Iran and was taking photos outside of Evan Prison when she was arrested and sent inside Evan Prison, which, by the way, is a horribly notorious prison in Tehran, and they tortured and killed her there. Now, Canada wanted her body back, and that's where her son wanted her to be buried, but the government pressured her elderly mother into having her buried in her hometown of Shiraz. And that was more than likely because they wanted to conceal all of the evidence of torture and rape that were all over Zara's body. So at this point, you must be wondering what happened to Judge Rezai. And I will tell you what happened. He was released and promoted. He became the judge of the appellate court in Neka, which gave him even more power and money. This is really interesting. So two months after Atifa's execution, the two morality police officers who had arrested her were themselves arrested for running a child sex ring. So they had all these houses full of children that were available to be sexually abused, and a lot of them were under the age of 10. These were the ones that drew up that fake petition, by the way. So, of course, Atifa was really not executed. She was murdered by Judge Rezai, who wanted to cover up all of the abuse that he had done to Atifa. But perhaps more significantly, he had to get rid of her because she was a symbol of female independence. The government cannot have even one girl or woman removing their headscarf. Because if they start letting girls or women get away with that, then their whole system is going to collapse. Some academics have drawn the connection between the headscarf and a woman's actual brain, meaning that the regime might be thinking that if a woman is wearing a headscarf, she is literally suppressing her independent thought, which is exactly what they want to do. Independent thought is obviously a huge threat to the regime. Atifa resisted Judge Rezai's male authority by correctly pointing out that Ali Darabi should have been tried instead of her, and Judge Rezai really did not like that. The fact that a young girl came into his courtroom and tried to undermine his authority by asserting her own thoughts must have made him feel extremely threatened. And of course, the stated goal of her execution was to teach both her and the public a lesson so that none of them would try this whole independence thing. Atifa has become somewhat of a feminist icon in the years following her execution, and for good reason. I just wanted to make sure that none of us forgot about her. Atifa's case is just terribly sad, and it's certainly a crime against humanity. But that's all I have for you today. Thank you so, so much for watching, and I will see you next time.